Hello, and thank you for watching this Q&A for Wuhan Wuhan. My name is Josh Martin, and I'm a programmer for the Austin Asian American Film Festival. And now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the film's director, Yang Chang, and uh, producer, uh, Diane Kwan. Thank you both for uh, joining us today. Thanks, Thanks so much for having for us. Thanks for having our film. Um, yes, this is a, a really great film. We're really, uh, really happy to be uh, presenting it. And um, just to kind of start things off, um, how did you uh, both come to be involved uh, with this project? I mean, I take it neither of you were in Wuhan uh, at the time when all this was happening. Uh, well, it, it completely remotely made. Um, I was, uh, I came on board uh, and inherited or was entrusted with the footage that was filmed by the team in um, uh, February, March of, uh, of uh, 2020, the, the crew in Wuhan uh, filmed 300 hours of material. And then um, in April, I came on board as the, uh, as the director to kind of see the film through and piece it together and shape it. Um, and uh, Diane also, I think at the same time, right? Yeah, I, I actually came in uh, after Young was already on board and that was actually one of the big reasons why I wanted to work on the film was to work with Young. I really admire him and uh, just love his work. And I also knew that a film would be made with great care if Young was spearheading it. So um, came on at May, like, like Young said, and it's interesting because I'm in Chicago, Young is in Toronto and all our editors were in LA but it worked out really well. Um, I don't think I've, I haven't met anyone from the team in person. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, and I've never met Diane in person. Like uh, it, it's all been done through the um, virtually and uh, which has been weird, but also kind of like, I guess you just kind of pick up and make it work, you know, and uh, it never, I mean, there's been some, in, you, you know, I think, it slows things down maybe a little bit, but actually in the end, I felt that the process for making the film was very smooth, like faster than I've ever uh, kind of completed a film before in terms of just uh, structuring it and editing it. Um, I think the team was all driven by this one particular goal and, uh, and, and we were inspired by a quote, you know, and, um, uh, and, a, and a quote that basically said that, you know, we're, we're all the same under the same, you know, we may live in different places, but we're, we're the same uh, under the same, we live under the same sky, you know? And, and so I think our intention was to, to make something very humanistic and, and show the, the human side of a faceless city like Wuhan that has been uh, kind of depicted in the media. Um, so can uh, I also ask what is, um, again, either one of you, what, what is your uh, experience of uh, Wuhan, if either, if any? I know you made uh, young. You made up the Yangtze, and Wuhan is, of course, it's on uh, the Yangtze. Right. So, had you been there before? Had you filmed there before? Yeah, I've been there before. On basically around the time I was making up the Yangtze, uh, I have good friends from uh, Wuhan. Um, in fact, uh, the director of Last Train of Home, Fan Li Xing, uh, was my sound recorder in up the Yangtze, and he is from. Uh, Wuhan city. And so uh, uh, it is a beautiful city. It is, um, has this, is in a way it's like Shanghai. It has a colonial kind of imprint. Uh, so there's a lot of Western architecture uh, as you see in glimpses in the movie and, and then also steeped in deep, you know, Chinese history and mythology. Um, I know the city con in contemporary times to be a thriving cultural hub, uh, like a huge art, and punk music scene. Incidentally, the, the composers of our film, Hua Lun, are, are from Wuhan. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I'd heard their music on a film they composed uh, called um, An Elephant Sitting Still, which is a beautiful uh, art house, black and white film by a Beijing director and, and one of my favorite films in the past five years. And I love that movie. And and found out the connection and, and that's how they came on board. So um, it, is a, uh, it is a big city, Wuhan, and it is not unlike any other metropolis in the world. And I have never even been to China. So, you know, I, I don't have experience with um, Wuhan, but I think I'm kind of the audience that we're trying to reach to show 
I, my, I have this image of what the uh, Wuhan looked like based on what the media has shown us or talked how they talked about it. And I was so surprised when I was watching the footage to see what a huge city it is and how beautiful and uh, how just big it is. Mm-hmm. And, and, and was great learning about the people and just seeing how, how much they all wanted to pull together uh, to help their community. Um, and I hope that comes through. And You know, actually that, that was something that was interesting, Diane, when we were screening the film for uh, so-called test audiences, uh, the reaction was a good handful of people had never, you know, assumed that Wuhan was a village and, uh, and so to see and the market, you know, and, like market, and, to, market, yeah. and to see images of this, you know, uh, emptied city uh, through the the bird's eye footage, the aerial footage, um, I think was quite eye opening for a lot of people. So wh- where did um, the footage come from? It's very professional, you know, level footage, and, and it's yeah. covering just a lot of ground around the city. You have all these different. You know, yeah. areas, different people. It's clearly it's not one person running around Wuhan with a cell phone. You know, just showing what's going on. Okay, no, this is this is filmed by a professional film crew, uh, a team of thirty. In fact, this team of thirty were in Wuhan in January to work on a production about uh, a documentary about the Yangtze River, um, and they were locked down in the city. And as a result, they pivoted and then turned their cameras and decided to kind of capture a story in the moment and, uh, and had uh, that, that kind of privileged access to be able to tell the story inside the hospitals and such. And, um, and I think that kind of goes to show, in a way, uh, you know, it's really how independent filmmakers, Chinese independent filmmakers work in mainland China is uh, you have one foot in uh, with broadcasters um, to get your media pass or something like this. And then the one foot out is that uh, that side that is trained as an independent filmmaker or journalist and to kind of capture um, with integrity a story unfolding. And, and that's, what, that's what this team did. Um, how does your kind of editorial approach differ when you're working with material that originates you know, elsewhere as opposed to your earlier films where you yeah. were presumably involved at all stages. I thought this is the first time that I've I've had to kind of direct a film that was already filmed. Usually I am on location. Usually I am the one who is uh who's directing where to point the camera and, and such. So um uh for me uh when I was asked to finish this film um I guess I had asked to see some of the footage and I watched 10 hours of material that was sent to me and I was kind of essentially blown away by the intimacy of the material, by the approach, which is so similar to my filmmaking approach, um, observational, um, I think more in close, closer to a film that I made called China Heavyweight, which felt more collaborative in that process where I was able to, you know, kind of have time with the subjects and the understanding that we were working on a production together. Whereas, you know, in other films, you're kind of chasing the story. This one felt like you could take your time and make it more cinematic and, and, and in a way narrative, um, obviously not writing dialogue and such, but, uh, but being able to work with your subjects so that they can allow a time and space to give you, you know, answers to a question that then become a scene. Do you know what I mean? And I was feeling that that was happening in this material. Um, and so as a director, it was quite liberating, in fact, uh, uh, to kind of receive footage unfiltered without this, the, you know, without the, um, uh, the feeling that I, I, I knew what I liked and disliked already and that I, that I needed, that I, that I didn't have distance. That's usually how I then pass footage over to the editing team. In this regard, I was sort of on the editing side of things and I could quickly very efficiently kind of cut through the stuff that wasn't the material that wasn't kind of speaking to me for the film as a whole. Um, and so uh, I enjoyed that part of it to kind of be more in on the, um, on the editing side of it to see the story clear. And, and as a producer, it was interesting because usually, you know, everything about the character and you come to know them and you know, what's happened uh, through the, 
time that you've shot with them, maybe a couple years. And so here it was like learning who are these people that you're really coming in uh, new and, and cold to it. So it's, it's was really yeah. a great discovery and leaning a lot to do the different, um, the editing team we had to um, share with us their impressions of who each of the characters are, who may be stronger, who may be not. So um, they were so critical and such a great team. Yeah, definitely. And I, I would add that, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it, filmmaking for me is a very collaborative process and, and with Diane and the producers on board and the editing team, like, you know, I'm not working in a silo at all. In fact, I can't, I'm, it's impossible for me to do that. So to have a team of editors and our lead editors uh, with Avita and Samoa, just kind of like throwing their talent into the structuring of a story was lovely. And, um, and I, uh, and so even though I was kind of feeling like I was on the editorial side of the process of filmmaking for this film, I really wasn't, I was still kind of like sitting back and, and, you know, waiting for the material to be kind of assembled. Then I would look at it, then we would work through the characters and that process still remained the same, but I guess, uh, um, and I like that. I appreciate actually allowing the talent of an editor to stand stand up and help shape things. It, it makes, and to put that trust in them, I learned a long time ago to, to kind of do that. And uh, um, I guess at the end of the day, I will always get the director credit, but but I know that that, that credit is, is kind of, you know, and we know in documentary that editing is so much a part of the process and in fact is like, uh, co-directing in a way and, and, and I, and they deserve all that credit because it, it, it really does come together because of their talents. And following up on that, were you, uh, in any, uh, communication with, uh, the people who are in the film or, you know, during the process or after the fact? You know, we had to follow up with the characters and in, indirectly we were in touch with them. I was always in communication with the local team, and um, and so uh, they were in communication then with the subjects. I made the decision not to really, I, in a way I felt like I didn't have to be um, 100% um, uh, you know, in communication with everyone. I didn't wanna be the one to have to kind of build another, um, or confuse the relationship process because we know there was a team in Wuhan that had built that intimacy, that connection to everyone. And so we were communicating this way. Um, I just took it as a privilege to be here and to be able to uh, kind of just feel um, unfiltered in how I put together the film. And so, you know, the film originally had followed nine different characters. And, and in the end, we, we narrowed it down to the, I guess the five stories you see. And, um, and, and I guess if I was a director on the ground, then seeing the footage and the film through that way, it would have been challenging to let go of the good, some of the things that were really beautiful, but I think in service of the movie, I, I could make that decision much quicker. Um, so yeah, I, uh, we did follow up with the subjects. Um, uh, you know, part of the process is making sure all the release forms are signed. And I guess Diane can speak on that more, but, but, you know, uh, uh, in order to release a film, you have to have everything kind of above ground. So, so we were very clear on making sure that was all done. Yeah. So, so as Young said, we all the communication was really through the the teams that that, that were there who had shot. And so, when we needed more material, especially for the ending, uh, Young would let them know what we're looking for, what we're hoping for. And some and other footage too that we needed some pickups and um, it was great that they were there and able to do that for us. Mm -hmm. You know, and also like I think also when we had to find a, a calligrapher for the opening titles, we we went through our channels to get that person from Wuhan. In fact, it was very important that we had a Wuhanese calligrapher give us that uh, that beautiful calligraphy in the opening. This is you know. Of course, it's not the only documentary uh, about Wuhan during the lockdown, but it does show uh, some sides of it that I, I have not seen in the other ones that have been made so far. Like, um, you know, we have that whole section with um, In, I believe, um, is the name going uh, shopping 
for a, 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 yeah. baby, a, a baby, uh, yeah. crib and, you know, going to all these empty shops, you know, there's no other customers around or the fact that, you know, we have, you know, a lot of doctors in the film, but one of them is a, is a psychologist, you know, which, you know, I had not seen that in the other films, which tend to be more focused on like the emergency personnel, mm -hmm. the people in you know, the respiratory, uh, mm -hmm wards and things so was there any point when you were going through all of this this 300 hours of footage and, and you're like you know wow i would not have expected them to focus on that and you're just they kind of bowled over and said that's got to go in yeah definitely and i think in the in the arc of editing the film um because essentially the the film we started editing in april 2020 when we in north america were just beginning our lockdown right and so uh, the footage we'd received was kind of a mirror into what we thought may be coming up and it was also kind of um a vivid in its in its reality of of the dangers of this virus and so uh at first that material the hospital footage really struck us and uh was kind of shocking and scary and and i think the initial pass on the uh, kind of edit on the film was to highlight the that dangerous element of of and this you know the fear factor of that of the virus but then I guess over the span of time that we were able to sit with the film it became less and less important to to dwell on that kind of footage uh, it became more important going back to that original theme of humanizing the city that we you know take that out not necessarily um, obfuscated from the film but but kind of focus more on the humanistic side of the story. So having a character like Dr. Jung, the psychologist, and having her backstory kind of in a very, it's not heavy. It's, it, it, there's just, you know, hints that she has a family and a, and a story as well, but that to see her, her kind of technique come into play in a, in a society, in a culture that usually uh, looks down upon, um, you know, therapy and, and psychology and, and, it feel treats it sort of as taboo to then see it used uh, in a way that's that is um, emphasizing mental health and mental awareness, mental mindfulness, you know. And so um, I thought that was, you know, so I think you see that the film kind of angles in on that side of that story to get outside of the hospital and to depict a full the breadth of a story that goes beyond um, what some of the other films are about out there. And I think. I think they all have a place, you know, they all fit uh, this genre now that we have the pandemic, you know, COVID genre. And, and, um, and I think our film was very consciously approached as uh, being a film that depoliticizes the virus and focuses on, uh, you know, the everyday experiences of everyday people, including frontline workers. All right. Well, thank you uh, for joining us. As I uh, said at the beginning, we're really happy um, to be able to bring this film to our audience. And um, I'm sure uh, the audience will also uh, get a lot out of uh, this Q&A, out of your answers today. So thank you uh, once again for joining us. And um, we're looking forward to uh, wh whatever comes next. Do you have like kind of any project in mind for like your post-COVID, post-lockdown, <laughs> post-2020? Yeah, I mean, Diane, do you, you want to? Yeah, actually, this? one of the I, I have a couple of films, but one of them is about uh, is is based in Austin. So, oh, okay, I'll, I'll let you yeah. know soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, I've got things cooking for sure, and I'm hoping uh, when I can, I'll be back in China working on a fiction feature, and I'm um, currently. I've optioned, I don't even know if Diane knows this, but I've optioned a book, um, a Canadian book uh, written by a Lao Canadian writer. And uh, it's a series of short stories called How to Pronounce Knife. And I'm adapting that into a, um, uh, a series. Uh, so fiction is kind of where I'm going a little bit, but also working on a doc, another feature doc. And this one's about uh, hockey in China. So keeping busy. Oh. All right. Well, we're looking forward to that for sure. So um, thank you again, and um, just for uh, our audience out there, enjoy uh, the festival, and enjoy Wuhan Wuhan, and um, all of our all the other offerings this year. Thank, thank you so you much. So much. Thank you. Thank you.